And, and always remember, people are watching and assessing your life. It, it is relatively easy to be Christian-like and do Christian-like things when you're gathered in a church on Sunday. You might even stand and raise your hands during the song, but there are people in your neighborhood or in your home or in your workplace that are watching how you respond and react to the things that go on around you in your life. And especially those of your own family, especially your own children. Look at verse 18. And he said to Zeba and Zalmunna, Gideon did, what kind of men were they whom you killed in the town of Tabor? which was a Jewish town, they answered and said, as you are, so they were. Each of them resembled the son of a king. They're kind of trying to flatter him by saying, they were just like you, but like the son of a king. They're trying to flatter him because they know that their lives are short here at this point. Then Gideon said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. And he said to note this, verse 20, to Jether, his firstborn son, rise and kill these two men, Zeba and Zalmunna. But the youth, the young boy, would not draw his sword for he was afraid because he was still just a kid. And so Zeba and Zalmunna said, rise yourself and kill us. For as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmunna and he took the crescent ornaments that were around their camels' necks. Be careful. When you're pushing in a direction that God is not leading, be careful. When in your heart is vengeance and retribution, and be careful when you're tempted to ask other people to engage in wickedness for you on your behalf. This is exactly what he does. He turns to his son, his firstborn son, who the scriptures say is just a youth. So he, he's, he's a kid, maybe a teenager, but still a kid. And he says, kill these guys. He wants his son to engage in the wickedness of retribution on his behalf. Verse 22, then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and and your son and your grandson also. After the victory against the Midianites, after he had killed Zeba and Zalmunna, the people of Israel, the men of Israel, they come to Gideon and they basically ask him to be their king. We want you to be our king and your sons and your grandsons to rule over us. They're asking him for the first monarchy and the first dynasty of Israel. This won't be the last time this happens. But they come to Gideon and they say, oh man, you are the one. Look at what you did. We want you to be our king. And... Gideon, at least with his words, he answers in the right way with his words. But as we're going to see, his actions do not follow his words. They came to him and they said, rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of the Midianites. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall your son, rule, my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. At that point, you go, oh yeah, all right, good. Gideon's doing the right thing. But like I said, doing the right thing in word only and not in deed. Because as we follow the story, what we discover is that he didn't really want the responsibility of being king, but he definitely wanted the reward of being king. Then Gideon said to them, I would make a request of you. They come to him, they say, Gideon, we want you and your son and your grandsons to rule over us as king. He says, listen, I'm not your king. God is your king. But... You know, his, his approval rating was high. He was polling really good in Israel. He says, I don't want to be your king because God's your king, but maybe just one small request of you. Oh, anything you want. Tell us exactly what you want. He says that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder. Your earrings from the plunder? Yeah, the people of the Midianites, they're from the region that was given to Ishmael. They would wear gold jewelry, including earrings, and in the plunder from the battle, they had taken a whole bunch of gold from the 150,000 people that they had taken down. So he says, please give me the earrings from your plunder. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And so they answered, we will gladly give them to you. And they spread out a garment on the ground and each one threw into it the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. You go, how much is that? About 42 pounds of gold. The answer is 42. How much is that? It's over $1.6 million in today's gold prices. 42 pounds of gold. Besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were around the camel's necks, 
And then Gideon made it into an ephod. What's an ephod? It's an outer garment, that which the priest would wear. So he took the gold and he turned it into a golden garment and he set it up in his own city, Ophrah. And all of Israel played the harlot with it. It became a snare to Gideon and to his house. At the beginning of his story, in Judges chapter 6, when he first began to follow God and do what God called him to do, God said, hey, listen, my, my first task for you is that you do a little bit of cleanup in your own father's house because his own father had set up an altar to the false god Baal in the main part of his town, Ophrah. And he had set up an altar to the false god Asherah. And God said, Gideon, you need to go and tear those things down. Now here, when he's victorious, he sets up a place of worship, not to Baal, not to Asherah, but really to himself. When, when he was victorious and he had great strength, he failed to remember that all of his strength came from his weakness and his trust in Almighty God. And now, even though he said with his words, I don't want to be your king, he certainly was acting like royalty. He's taking all the glory, taking all the credit, and setting himself up as an idol to be worshipped. And the people came and played the harlot with it there. They bowed down and they basically worshipped him as Israel's top idol. Point number four. God's true victors know that the glory belongs entirely to God. And then Jerubal that's Gideon, verse 29. The son of Joash went and dwelt in his house. Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son whose name is called Abimelech. Keep that name in your mind for next week, Abimelech. God, when the children of Israel were getting ready to come into the promised land under Moses and Moses spoke to them in Deuteronomy, Moses cautioned the people that they not take to themselves, themselves a king like the other nations round about them. He cautioned them and told them that God is to be your king, but be careful when you do take a king, he's gonna multiply to himself wives. And Gideon here, he said, I don't want to be your king, but what did he do? He, he took gold from them and set himself up to be glorified and honored, and he took wives like a king. So he wanted all the reward of being the king, but he did not want the responsibility of leading the people as unto the Lord as the king ought to do if there was going to be a king. His life is an interesting story. I guess I missed point number three, just by the way. True victory never follows unrighteous actions. A good point to throw that in there. And he was certainly walking in unrighteousness when he did these things. He used his victory as an opportunity for immorality. And ultimately, as we're going to see when we get into chapter 9 next week, he left things for his wicked and bone-hunted son to take over, Abimelech, after he had been an abysmal example to him. In the end, it's all about how you finish and not how you begin. And the story of Gideon is really a sad story about someone who really started well, but didn't end well. Now, it begs the question, how is it then that his name appears in the hall of faith? And that's actually a really good question, but I want to let you know there's a number of people in the hall of faith where you kind of scratch your head and go, how is it that Abraham is in the hall of faith and David is in the hall of faith? And how is it that these people who had such great failures in the life, how is it that they are in the hall of faith? Well, they are in the hall of faith because God is gracious. And they were noteworthy for the times when they trusted in God and relied in him. And Gideon certainly trusted in God and relied on him, but there were certain times where he let that slide. And his story is a reminder to us that it's not really about how you begin, it's how you end. And that's why immediately following Hebrews chapter 11 and the hall of faith, we read in Hebrews chapter 12 these words. Since we are surrounded 
by so great a cloud of witnesses, those who followed God by faith, and when they followed God by faith, they were exemplary and noteworthy. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, laying aside every weight and sin that does so easily ensnare us. When you read a story like Gideon's or like when we get to David years from now, we're reminded of the words of a Bible teacher I've listened to for years that are so strong and good. The best of men are men at best. And we will always be here in this life still sinners. And can always still be tempted and ensnared by sins that do so easily trip us up. And therefore, we need to circumspectly lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily ensnare us and run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Christ. At some point in the life of Gideon, he, he stopped looking to God and started trusting in himself. And take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall.